This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. I'm Rita Redberg. I'm a cardiologist here and uh, editor of JAMA Internal Medicine, where we have the Less Is More series. But I'm here just to introduce uh, George Sawaya, who we're really pleased. I'm very excited about your lecture. George is a professor of obstetrics, gynecology, and reproductive sciences, as well as epidemiology and biostats at UCSF. He's a practicing OBG obstetrician gynecologist. And he's also director of the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital Colposcopy Clinic, which is a high volume inner city clinic. Um, his research interest is related to that in cervical cancer screening. And he has served as an invited expert to the Centers for Disease Control, as well as the American Cancer Society. And you probably, he's very uh, prolific in uh, scientific and in some in the lay press. He's a former member of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, which makes recommendations on cancer screening. And at UCSF, he's a member of the Academy of Medical Educators, and he's the educational lead for the UCSF Center for Healthcare Value, which um, Dr. Dudley, who you just met, is the director. So I'm very pleased to turn the mic over to Dr. George Sawaya. Well, thank you, Dr. Redberg. I'm Really excited to be here. I love talking about cancer screening. I actually love talking about screening in general because I think that it sounds great, but we don't talk really about uh, some of the downsides of screening. And so I'm going to filter that through this lecture so that you'll get a more comprehensive view about screening. And so when you hear about guidelines that are recommending less screening or no screening, you'll be able to put that in the right context. So the objectives are, I'll give you a bit of a historical perspective on screening and cancer in particular. Some problems with screening, we'll do a few case studies and I'll talk about guidelines and in particular how we can make high value care guidelines and then what the future might hold for screening. I'm also going to forewarn you that I'm going to be asking you some questions. So you have to uh, think about some of the things I'm saying because I'll ask you to vote on some things. So screening and prevention are what I call tricky business. It's tricky because, and I can tell you from someone who's done cervical cancer screening studies uh, uh, over many years, it's tricky because we all want to think about maximizing benefits for a population, but just by screening we're taking well people and we're trying to enhance their health in the future. But we have to be careful to not turn them into sick people in the present in that pursuit. We also, so this is why uh, I always go back to the dictum that it's hard to make well people weller. The pitfalls are that sometimes with screening we find abnormalities that are harmless or we find some that are incurable. And we have to think about what the true value is of finding those types of lesions. Once we know that there might be a benefit, we have to think about the harms and how to balance those correctly. And is that something we should do uh, from a population societal point of view? Or should that live within the individual and how the individual thinks about benefits and harms? And where do we know how to draw that line? And we, of course, we have to think about resources and costs. The subtext here is that the US population is highly enthusiastic about cancer screening. And there's a medical legal environment that's very active that rewards vigilance. So you put those two things together, and you get a lot of screening, some of which is inappropriate. So it's always controversial when we should begin screening. If someone says start at 50, some will say it should be 40, and there'll be other people saying 30. The age to end screening 
Anytime someone puts a stake in the ground, 65, there's someone to say, who is willing to say never. The tests that we use, and of course in a very active environment, we have new tests emerging. There's a lot of market influences on the tests that we use and how often we should be applying a screening test over someone's lifetime. So I'm going to start at the beginning. This is a historical perspective. This looks like a friendly face now compared to uh, what we've been seeing. The, uh, Richard Nixon passed the National Cancer Act of 1971, and that's what uh, we started colloquially cause it, calling the war on cancer. This was a big funding mechanism to uh, help the federal government fund uh, cancer research. And it was very successful. We have a lot of enthusiasm for cancer screening in the U.S. This is a, a somewhat older study, but this was a, a broad-based uh, survey of free-living Americans who uh, were asked their opinions about cancer screening. About 87% thought that routine cancer screening was almost always a good idea. Lots of enthusiasm for it. 74% thought finding cancer early saves lives most or all of the time. One third believed that an 80-year-old who, cho who, uh, uh, who chooses not to be screened for cancer was irresponsible. So there's this kind of an overlay that you know, people really have a responsibility to participate in the screening programs. 56% want to be tested for good cancers. These are the ones that are just going to sit there. They look like cancer under the microscope, but they're not going to do anything harmful. They're never going to become uh, come to clinical light, but a lot of people want to know if they had those types of cancers. And about three-quarters would prefer to receive a total body CT scan looking for cancer instead of receiving $1,000. So this is kind of amazing. So this filtered, this is probably a product of a very good public health campaign that started quite a long time ago, and this is an ad from 1990. And this is by the American Cancer Society, and it says, if you haven't had a mammogram, you need more than your breasts examined. Again, suggesting that no logical, reasonable person would uh, not participate in a screening program. Interestingly, this says if you're a woman at over age 35, you should start being screened. Now, as you might know, and we'll talk about later on, the controversy about when to begin screening is really 40 versus 50, but this is even saying 35. So that gives you a little framing of how uh, we've been talking about cancer screening. And even stamps in the late 1990s, prostate cancer awareness, annual checkups and tests, right on the stamp. Annual checkups and tests, and as you might know, prostate cancer screening by the most commonly, uh, uh, the most common method of screening is actually no longer recommended by one major guideline group, and we'll talk about that in a moment. <clears throat> so I'm going to give you five ground rules for reasonable screening programs. Number one, high quality evidence about the benefits, meaning that finding disease in asymptomatic people and treating it leads to improved outcomes compared with waiting to treat people who become symptomatic. Now we often know this through experiments, meaning randomized trials where we randomly assign people to being screened versus not being screened. We follow them over time and we look at cancer incidence and mortality. And I'm, giving, I'm gonna give you an example of that in just a moment. The poster child for screening that really got everyone very enthusiastic was cervical cancer screening with pap smears. Now, cervical cancer screening is a little different than a lot of cancers. It's a very long time between a precancerous lesion turning into cancer. So there are many opportunities for us to find that through screening. That time is about 10 years going between the highest grade precancer to invasive cancer. Lots of opportunities to find it and treat it. The susceptible part of the cervix is about the size of the tip of my little finger. So if we find it, we can treat it very easily just in the office. We can either freeze that area or we can just remove that area about the size of a dime. And that's a curative procedure. Well, that's really quite different than trying to screen for a disease that lives deep within the body, right? Like ovaries or the pancreas or something of that sort. So cervical cancer is great. It's a great success story of cancer screening, but we can't really expect all cancers to necessarily follow that model because they don't have that long pre-invasive state. We can't 
identified and treated without uh, undue harm. And there are other uh, aspects of this that I'll go through as I go down the list. We have to have high quality evidence about the harms. Understanding the magnitude of patient-centered adverse outcomes due to screening. And this includes psychological distress. With cervical cancer screening, we know that lots of women will have an abnormal pap smear and be followed for many years, potentially, if that abnormality doesn't go away. And we know that about 60 or 70 percent of these women in surveys have substantial psychological distress about being under surveillance for something that can't be found, can't be treated, but is somewhat abnormal. And that can really, really be quite wearing on people. So we have to take that into account as well. It's not all about the benefit of decreasing incidence of mortality. It all is in the context of what we have to do to, uh, to, um, uh, to people to try to achieve the benefit. And I always kind of think about the, it's like if we have a war on cancer, we also have some collateral damage because we're not really that precise in the way we screen. Making a judgment about net benefits, and that's described as benefits minus the harms. And you can imagine a lot of reason judgment comes in to making that determination. Sometimes it's done by a guideline group. Sometimes it's done by individuals. And we'll talk about the difference. The tests have to be acceptable to patients. It can't be noxious. It can't be extremely harmful because we're, we're applying it to well people, right? It has to be acceptable, both the tests and the treatments. When we talk about lung cancer screening, which we'll briefly talk about for high-risk people, we have to remember that the people who benefit from this are the ones who are willing to undergo a major surgery and have part of their lung removed. It's very different than having a little part of the cervix removed in the office, right? So these are the types of uh, things we need to think about in terms of acceptability, not of just the test, but also of the treatment. And reasonable resources need to, uh, uh, need to uh, uh, come to bear in terms of doing the testing, the follow-up of abnormal tests, and the treatments, and having really high-quality attention to all of these things, right? We have to make sure whoever's reading our pap smears has good training, they're doing that appropriately. Whoever's doing the colposcopy, this is what I do, looking at the cervix, doing biopsies and treatments, have good training and can minimize the harms while they are uh, providing the benefits. Pitfall. Who knows who these people are? Who are these people? Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood. V. Van Cleef. Eli Wallach, fantastic. So why am I showing this picture? The good, the bad, and the ugly. That's correct. <laughs> and so cancers can be thought of as being good, bad, and ugly. Good cancers are the ones I mentioned before. They are just sitting around. None of them become symptomatic, and none of them cause death. They're just sitting there, but they look like cancer on the microscope but they're just slow and just sitting there. The bad cancers all become symptomatic if left alone and all cause death if left alone, but these are detectable and they're treatable and they're curable. The ugly cancers all become symptomatic, all cause death regardless of detection and treatment. Each organ site probably has a proportional attribution to good, bad, and ugly. If the proportion attributable to bad is high, these are generally cancers that we can screen for because they are amenable to detection and early treatment that averts bad outcomes, including death. So we want to find Lee Van Cleef. So here's a few case studies in cancer screening. You all with me so far? Let's talk about thyroid cancer screening. In South Korea, it is provided frequently as an add-on. They have centralized health care, but for uh, $30 to $50, your uh, clinician may recommend or uh, offer you thyroid screening. And there's generally, there's a government media-supported early detection of cancer um, uh, campaign, so people are pretty friendly to the concept of getting screened for cancer. Now, some physicians started uh, becoming concerned about overdiagnosis and suggested that this was really not a good idea, 
But they also realized that trying to explain the harms of inappropriate testing was really difficult to do on a population level, especially when people uh, have a lot of enthusiasm for cancer. So here's what happened in uh, South Korea. The incidence of thyroid cancer skyrocketed over the period of time when screening began. But there was no change in the mortality. So a lot of the disease was found, but it really had no impact on mortality. So what is going on here? What would you think is going on if we're finding a lot of disease, but it's not really causing death? Clint Eastwood. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> doo -doo 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 -doo. That was the theme song from The Good, Bad, and the Ugly. Um, finding Clint Eastwood, that's right, the good. Thyroid cancer is now the most common type of cancer diagnosed in South Korea. Isn't that interesting? It's not a common diagnosis in the U.S., relatively. About 40,000 were diagnosed in 2011. There are about 65,000 cases diagnosed in the U.S., but we have a much larger country. Now, uh, most of these patients are treated with radical thyroidectomy, and these cancer surgery have consequences of lifelong thyroid replacement therapy. About 11% have hypoparathyroidism, which is a, an adverse effect of surgery by disturbing the parathyroid glands. And about 2% of patients have a vocal cord paralysis. So when you look at this, you say, well, you can find things, you can treat them, you harm a lot of people, but there's really no evidence of a benefit. In 1947, it was noted that thyroid cancer was frequently found at autopsy, but rarely a cause of death. So this has been known for quite a long time. About a third of adults have small thyroid cancers. How many people in this room have a thyroid cancer? Well. I might, right? So this is just a common thing that we see, but a not a common cause of death. So it's one of the good cancers. No net benefit. Screening more harmful than beneficial. Now I'm going to focus on ovarian cancer. Now ovarian cancer is uncommon. It's diagnosed very late, at a late stage. It seems to come out of nowhere. And it's deadly, and it's a terrible cancer. I, as a gynecologist, I've seen many patients with ovarian cancer, and I can just tell you it's a very, it's a very, uh, it's a very profound illness. So in the U.S., uh, about a decade ago, we decided to see if we could understand whether or not screening for ovarian cancer actually leads not to just to detection of more ovarian cancer, but also a decrease in mortality, because this is such a deadly disease that it's very hard to treat it once it becomes symptomatic because it has a, a very high mortality rate. So this was an experiment done where they randomly assigned almost 80,000 women in the U.S. to being screened versus not being screened or being, having usual care. And they were screened with a blood test and, for, uh, and with a sonogram. A blood test for six years and a sonogram for four years. And they followed these people for 12 years. Can you imagine a study where you randomized people, 80,000 people, and followed them for 12 years? This is an enormous effort, right? So here's what they found. This solid line, it doesn't project very well, is the, is the group that got screened. And this dotted line is the group that did not get screened, got usual care. So screening, in fact, this is uh, cumulative cases of ovarian, of ovarian cancer. So if you look for it, you will find it. So you found more ovarian cancers in the screen group. But that wasn't what they were looking for. They were looking to see whether or not by finding it through screening when it was asymptomatic, whether or not that treatment of those patients at an early stage would lead to a mortality benefit there was no mortality benefit. This shows you, and this is at 13 years after randomization, this is the screen group. They actually have a bit of a higher mortality than this group. So it wasn't even really a close call, right? So the, uh, 
the interpretation of this was that screening doesn't work. So what do you think is going on here? The ugly. Who is the ugly? Poor Eli Wallach, you know, I mean, going through life kind of being the ugly, right? But uh, yes, yeah, so Eli Wallach, finding Eli Wallach, and we don't want to find these types of cancers. But as we all know, we've all known people, and certainly all physicians have known patients who have what we think are screenable cancers, but they have a variant of it that is severe, that is out of control, and that comes out of nowhere. This just reminds us that we can do only so much with screening. As you know, as mentioned, I'm a gynecologist. We, we have made great strides in cervical cancer prevention through screening, but we also have done a lot of hysterectomies in the U.S. In some surveys, up to 40% of women by the age of 65 in the U.S. have had a hysterectomy, which is an enormous number. But we have really removed a lot of people out of the, out of the risk pool because if you have no cervix, you can't get cervical cancer. But there are very few organs that we can remove so clandestinely where people don't know they're gone, right? So this is why if any other country wants to emulate our success in cervical cancer prevention, they would probably have to mirror to some degree our hysterectomy rates, which is not a desirable thing to do. But also we have to realize that other cancers might not be able to follow the same success story because we can't remove the entire target organ without causing quite a bit of life disruptions and harms to individuals. So you see how all these analogies, they just kind of fall apart, right? Why can't everything be like cervical cancer? Because not everything's like the cervix. That's the answer. So late-stage disease was similar between the two groups. Remember the hope was that in the screen group you would find more of these early-stage cancers and intervene on them, and that would cure them. But even with screening, even in the screening group, almost 80% were stage 3 or 4, late-stage, out of the pelvis. This is terrible. This means this disease goes from 0 to 100 in a very short period of time. Unlike cervical cancer, it sits around pre pre-invasive state, for a good 10 years, we just don't have that luxury in this cancer. The natural history is just different. Colorectal cancer screening. I'm not going to give you much more than just the, what I would call the ecological look at this. These are new cases of colorectal cancer. In colorectal cancer, we screen largely for pre-invasive lesions, and we treat them. It follows the same model of cervical cancer there's a lot of opportunity to find and treat a pre-invasive lesion before it becomes cancer. So with the advent of screening, we've seen a decrease in the incidence and the mortality of colorectal cancer. So what's going on here? Lee Van Cleef. So it's kind of the bad cancer, but we want to screen for bad cancers because, in fact, we can make an impact on them. So where do evidence-based cancer screening guidelines come from? Well, a lot of them come from professional societies, the American Cancer Society, for Women's Health, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the American College of Physicians also promotes high-value, cost-conscious guidelines. And there's another group, are you aware of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force? The uh, current task force chair is a faculty member at UCSF, just announced yesterday, Kirsten Bibbins Domingo. So um, the task force, uh, I think that uh, as, um, as Rita mentioned, I was a member of the task force uh, many years ago, and so I can speak a little bit about its processes. This is a governmental group, this governmentally supported, I should say, but an independent panel, congressionally mandated, 16 experts in prevention sit on the panel, two of whom are gynecologists. There are a variety of specialties that are represented. They get scientific support from an evidence-based practice center. So instead of saying, hey, what do you think about the evidence on this? Someone else does all that evidence gathering. This is a very long, very arduous, very expensive process to put all the summary evidence before the panel to look at to make a judgment about its uh, adequacy and then its relevance. It does not consider costs, medical legal issues, or insurance coverage in its deliberations. 
And we can talk a little bit about that, whether or not they should, but they don't. <clears throat> so what do they recommend? Or, uh, what do they discourage? They discourage prostate cancer screening, as I mentioned, despite what the stamp says. Recommends against prostate-specific antigen-based screening. Of course, the task force, um, the stamp preceded the task force recommendation. Pancreatic cancer recommends against screening ovarian and testicular cancer. All, in all of these, the harms are believed to outweigh the benefits. The ones they do recommend screening for are ones that we've mentioned. Colorectal cancer, lung cancer, cervical cancer, and breast cancer. And I'm going to spend a little time talking about breast cancer because it's gotten a lot of press. It's a very popular thing to talk about. And I'm going to give you the insider view on the kind of information uh, or at least a piece of the information that the task force might look at and does look at to come up with their guidelines that were, have been fairly controversial. I told you that one of the major challenges is figuring out when to begin, when to end, how often to screen, which test to use, and what should be done in people with abnormal tests but no evidence of disease. I'm very interested in that because they kind of fall in this gray zone. They're not told they're totally normal. They're not on their way to a treatment that we think is going to benefit them. They're sitting in this uncertainty area and with a, a, not a very clear path forward. And which strategy of screening is both cost-effective and affordable? Some people don't make that distinction, but I'm going to have you think about the difference between cost-effective and affordable, but hold on to that thought. So here's the breast cancer story, at least the one that has been... Uh, I'll go probably back 30 years and start talking about how this all came about. It was observed that a lot of these cancers were fatal. A lot of them were late stage in the diagnosis. So the thought was, well, why don't we find it earlier? That's a very natural thing to think, right? Let's find it earlier. Let's promote self-examination. Let's promote uh, x-rays mammograms, because if we can't feel it, maybe we can see it, right, by, by using an x-ray. That makes good sense. Then there were some experiments where women were, women were randomly assigned to screening versus no screening, just like I said for ovarian cancer. And there were several trials of that, several randomized trials. And there are public health campaigns that I've mentioned, which is on the background of this slide. <coughs> But there was always this question about when to start screening. And we had the best evidence of efficacy in women over 50, but it was a little less clear back in the 90s about whether or not screening mammography was efficacious in women under 50. And as you might remember, that has been one of the major controversies. Now, in 1997, the NIH had a consensus conference where they decided they were going to make some evidence-based recommendations. And when it came to uh, making a recommendation about women 40 to 49, they concluded that the data were pretty mixed, that they, they couldn't make a blanket recommendation, and they thought it would be best to disclose to women our uncertainty. Full disclosure, we don't really know. Might be beneficial, might not be, but we do know that it, it can cause harms. So we wanted, that was the, the idea 20 years ago, was that we should start informing people about our uncertainty. Now, in February of that year, the chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee, which was Arlen Specter, he uh, got wind of this recommendation being a little soft on women 40 to 49, and it wasn't sitting very well with him. So he pressed the NCI director to disavow this consensus panel conclusion. And he said, well, you know, we haven't made a decision on funding your entire institute yet, but we're going to wait and see what you say about this issue to, um, before we um, uh, make our funding recommendation. So there's a little, there's certainly huge politi uh, political forces here. But as you know, you know, from a scientific point of view, we want to promote the best science and kind of devoid of politics. And that's what the task force is set up to do. And in March 27, the National Cancer Advisory Board recommended 17 to 1 uh, annual screening for women 40 to 49. It wasn't that it was so obvious that the data supported that. It was just there was some political pressure. And this story has all been well documented by Virginia Ernster, 
who was uh, chair of the Department of Epi Biostats at UCSF and a member of this panel. And I wonder if she was this person. I don't know. So it became clear there was a lot of press about this, and the executive editor of the New England Journal wrote an article in the New York Times, well, it was quoted in an article in the New York Times Magazine saying, in, in short, so small would the payoff of regular mammograms at this age be that the risk of driving the car to get them might well outweigh the benefits of the test. So he's trying to put it into the context about we're really hiding the magnitude of this benefit if it even exists. Now the story continues. Now let's fast forward to 2009. The task force again questions the age to begin screening. Now, by this time, there were actually there was some better evidence about the efficacy of screening in women under 50. And the task force actually came to the conclusion that there was a mortality benefit by starting screening in women in their 40s. It was about a 15% reduction in breast cancer mortality. So there was better evidence of the magnitude of harm uh, a magnitude of benefit, and there was better evidence of the magnitude of harm. So they could start trying to think about that balance. And it was clearer, and the task force believed, that the benefit outweighed the harms in all women, but they still believed that the balance was really quite delicate. There was adequate evidence. This, that was the new part, but it still, it was a delicate balance. And this is why they... Uh, made this recommendation about 40 to 49 that we should have a discussion with women. Very similar to what they said in 19, uh, the other group said in 1997, it's a discussable, disclosable uh, issue and we should have informed decision making. Now, this is the slide. It's got a lot of numbers on it, but it's the one I want you to think about because this is the type of information that a guideline group might look at to come up to some conclusion about two things. When to start screening, and how often to screen. The top panel is screening every year. The bottom is every two years. This is starting at age 40. This is at age 50. They all end at the same year. Across the top, this is a theoretic cohort of 1,000 women being screened. Here's what you would expect from screening them. Total mammograms over this period of time the breast cancer deaths averted, the false positive test results, and the unnecessary biopsies. And here's what you should notice, which is obvious. The most aggressive strategy of starting at 40 and doing it every year is the most tests. It has the most false positives and unnecessary biopsies. For 1,000 women, this guarantees that on average, you're going to have two false positives per woman with this strategy, right? That's what that means. Now, the least aggressive strategy, you do many fewer tests, you have fewer false positives, and you have unnecessary biopsies or less. And here's the breast cancer averted differential. It varies between five and eight per thousand women screened. That's the kind of information people look at and then someone asked them to draw a line. So where would you draw a line? We'll come back to that in a minute. So in November, the task force looked at that information, and they changed its recommendation from one to two years in women over 40 to recommending against routine screening of women age 40 to 49. They said, you know, it's really not fair, really, to just give a woman, oh, you're 40, here's your requisition, go to the end of the hall and turn right, without any kind of a discussion about the true magnitude of benefits and harms. They felt that was unfair. And they said, if a woman at the age of 40 wants to start, that it should be an individual choice and take into account her context and her values regarding specific benefits and harms. This is the informed choice. This is not new. This is kind of what they said like in 97, right? So it's just very similar wording. It's just being a little more pointed about it by saying they recommend against routine screening. Now, this was just like everything went wild. Do you remember when all this happened? This happened to be in an election year. It happened in November. So there was nothing good about the timing of this. 
The headline reads, Government Panel Recommends Against Mammograms in Women. Now, it's true they recommend against routine mammograms. And no one followed up by saying, but of course, if you want one, you can have one as long as you understand what the benefits and harms are. That wasn't ever really part of the story. But that doesn't make for a very good story, right? Who's going to read that article? So there's confusion, fear, and anger. There was um, politicization of the issue. Uh, Again, it was around an election year. People were concerned this was the harbinger of rationing. We had gone from rational medicine to rationing, and that was very, uh, people were quite fearful of that. The co-chairs of the task force were actually called to testify before Congress and explain this. Uh, How could you have come to that conclusion? So it still has some very political overtones. And the task force ended up saying, you know, we stand by what we said, but the only difference is that we probably needed a better messenger. You know, we needed to package this up a little differently. We need a little PR uh, uh, to try to help us do this a little more uh, in a friendlier way. The story gets personal. There are lots of personal stories. This is one from the Contra Costa Times. Three years ago, a patient uh, rushed to a clinic after finding a hard, rough-edged lump in her breast, and a mammogram and biopsy confirmed that she had breast cancer. And then when she heard about this new recommendation, she's 42, she said, this is a disaster. Look at my case. They're trying to save a buck, and the first place they start is with women. So this was a common story. What I found interesting about this is this woman's cancer wasn't found with a mammogram. She found it herself. So it's it's not as if this policy would have changed her outcome. So it's kind of interesting that a lot of the stories didn't quite fit the, the bigger story. And then the story got a little confusing, at least to me. This is uh, from March 2010, the director of Uh, a well-known university. I had to put an X there because I felt a little embarrassed telling you which one it was, but uh, a well-known university uh, director of breast imaging disagreed with the task force conclusion that the number of lives saved was outweighed by the risks of screening for that age group. Well, that's not what the task force said. They said that actually the benefits outweigh the harms and it's a delicate balance. And then she said, women need to know that with routine mammograms, there may be false positives and need for biopsies, but a woman should make that choice for themselves with a doctor's help. Well, that's really what the task force actually said. So there was a lot of misunderstanding about what the task force said. But again, there was a lot of more interesting stories to tell than that were a little less fact-based. The 35,000-foot view is there was a media frenzy. There were a lot of inaccuracies. The bottom line is... People should talk about things with their doctors and discuss this. If you're well, you don't want to become a patient inadvertently. And uh, my view of this is that was a more empowering and less paternalistic way of practicing medicine. And I'm hoping that that's going to be more the way of the future. But the reality is that, quite frankly, no one knows how to do that well, and no one has the time to do that. So we're really challenged with trying to really figure out how we can best engage patients in decision-making that... It doesn't really crowd out other time with their doctor. And this doesn't have to be done with the doctor. Another allied healthcare professional can talk to patients about their benefits and harms, and then the patient can go to her doctor and say, I understand now, and here's what I want to do, right? That would not crowd out anyone's time, but it does take other resources. But I think they might be more patient-centered and, and, and better uh, and, and resources well spent. So I'm back to this. I told you I would come back. So given all that, which of the four strategies would you choose as a recommendation? This is like if you were making a recommendation. It's not for an individual person, but just in general to the population. Would you choose uh, this strategy? How many would choose this top strategy? It's okay to choose it. Would you choose this one, the bottom? This is the least aggressive. So some enthusiasm for that. Would you choose this one every year starting at 50? You save, you have one fewer breast cancer death, but you have um, more false positives. And what about C? Anyone for C? So you can see a lot of people look at the same data and they come with different conclusions because we all have different experiences, right? 
And there's a lot of judgment that comes in here. So this is the challenge of making guidelines. It's a one-size-fits-all to, to, to everyone. I would even go further to say that it doesn't happen that magically at 50 we shouldn't disclose benefits and harms to women about mammography, right? So um, what about costs? Should we be thinking about costs when we make these decisions? I'll tell you, this is a recent publication in 2014 where they did simulations over um, uh, of screening every other year beginning at 50 compared to screening every year beginning at 40, and the cost differential per year for the country is about $8 billion. That's kind of a, that's a, that's a sizable chunk of money, right? So even though there are some kind of varying opinions about, yes, I would do that and do that. The, this have huge effects on our healthcare economy. And we have to think about whether or not this is really value. You know, we can avert more bad outcomes at a cost and, and cause more harms, and there's a financial cost that goes with it. So this all kind of sits within uh, the minds of people thinking about uh, uh, making recommendations. But the task force can't think about costs but other groups are certainly allowed to, but they typically don't. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you about something that I read about recently that I thought was really interesting and novel. And this is a process called deliberative democracy. How many of you have ever served on a jury? Great. I have too. I served on a jury last year, and it was fantastic. It was really one of the most interesting things I did the whole year. Um, in New Zealand, they have a centralized healthcare system. So everyone contributes to the pot of money, and everyone gets health benefits out of that same pot. They decided they would kind of do a jury process and say, well, why don't we put breast cancer screening on trial? Because anyone, you've all, nearly all of you have been on a jury, there's a lot of information, right? You have to really keep up with the information, the credibility of the information. It's a very similar process. Uh, how do you then kind of come up with a final judgment based on that, all that information? They asked women. They chose, they had 80 applicants, just like a jury pool, and, it get, and they got chosen, 11 of them, age 40 to 49. They all believed that screening for cancer was a good thing, and they all supported mammography for women in their age group. And they were asked, should the New Zealand government offer free screening mammograms to women of their age? This is interesting because they all have kind of a stake in the game, right? Because they all are contributing to, to the, the health uh, care budget. So they, they do want to make sure that their, their money is being used wisely. So on Wednesday evening, they had a brief briefing. On Friday, they had a presentation from cancer screening ex experts, just like you would in a jury. They're asked, they were able to ask questions examine evidence. On Friday, they deliberated, and they had an independent moderator who helped them kind of keep things straight, but who was making no judgments. And on Saturday morning, they conferred again with no advisors present, and they reached a conclusion. And they voted 10 to 1 against recommending government provision of mammographic screening for women in that age group. I thought that was fascinating. They all went from supporting it to then thinking about it in a policy lens and coming up with a really an opposite conclusion. Kind of fascinating. So someone mentioned precision medicine. And so maybe the future of cancer screening can be, uh, can be improved with precision medicine. Maybe we can have genetic markers that predict risk for individuals. And, you know, we, uh, we screen a lot. We screen everyone for all the screenable cancers. As an example... A woman's lifetime risk of getting cervical cancer, if she did not get screened at all, is about 3%. So that means 97% of women need no pap smears. So why can't we figure that one out? We're getting a little closer by at least screening, uh, thinking about screening women for the causative agent, which is a viral infection, human papillomavirus, and trying to make that as a determination. But there are probably some other genetic markers, host markers, as well as infection markers that help us predict this risk a little bit better. Uh, biomarkers that predict behavior of tumors. Under the light microscope, I told you, a lot of things look the same, but we can't necessarily predict their behaviors, but maybe the future holds better biomarkers to do that. 
combinations of genetic markers and cancer characteristics that predict outcomes in individuals. We do that to some degree in predicting uh, who might get breast cancer using the Gale model and all these scores, and maybe uh, finding uh, a subgroup of patients who uh, could take chemo-preventive medications to decrease their risk of cancers. Less population-based screening and more targeted screening. And really thinking about higher value care, maximizing the quality and the patient experience at a lower cost. Closing comments. Predicting average outcomes in populations of people vastly, is vastly different than predicting outcomes in individuals. We know much more about groups than we know about people, right? That's just the way it is. It's like st statistics versus a guessing game. It's hard to make a well person weller. I say that many times. And it really is a, an outgrowth of our oath to do no harm that we take as physicians. And I think that a lot of our approach to cancer screening is going to depend on informing our consumers about evidence, understanding their preferences better, their values, and I guess giving everyone a healthy dose of the limitations of medicine. We can't uh, do everything through screening or even prevention. Uh, I've certainly had patients who've had a lifelong of normal pap smears who have ended up suddenly having cervical cancer. It could be that their cancer wasn't the kind that follows that nice slow path. And uh, maybe the biggest risk factor is just simply having a cervix. But we all have organs that could potentially become cancerous and we can only do so much. So I leave you with this slide, which I took images of all the ways that we as humans try to make predictions about things, right? That's the common element. And it, all the way, it goes all the way from uh, Renaissance art to the things we used to do. And there's probably an app for this now, right? Rather than that little paper thing. Do you remember the paper thing from third grade? And uh, even predicting the stock market, et cetera. And do you remember who this is and what, what he's doing, Carson. Johnny Carson? Great. The great Karnak, right? So we've been fascinated with predictions. And I'm hoping that we're going to get better at making predictions so that we can move from screening everybody so frequently and causing a lot of harms in our war on cancer and try to be a little more focused to where we can actually have a greater impact at a lower cost and with higher value. So with that, I'll end and I'll take some questions. So the question is about what about people with a family history? And not just a casual family history, but a real family history that's really concerning. And I'm going to say for breast cancer for example. Most of the guidelines that we have exclude those women. There's separate guidelines for high-risk women. And there are separate management strategies for high-risk women, including genetic testing for, uh, uh, for mutations like BRCA1 and BRCA2. And there are even other strategies in really high-risk women who are found to be at risk of having uh, uh, prophylactic bilateral mastectomy, for example. Someone mentioned Angelina Jolie earlier and she followed that path. So these women are generally excluded from the general guidelines which are really focused on average risk women. Yes. Right, so the question is, what about um, risk factor, uh, what about women whose mothers died at an older age, like at age of 80 with breast cancer? Does that kind of count? I would say that, it, you know, certainly the longer you live, the incidence of cancer goes up, and there are going to be sporadic cancers that happen in people that may be in your family but may not have that genetic basis or put them at risk. We're fortunate enough at UCSF and other places to where we can do, we have genetic counselors who can talk to patients about their true risk if they're really concerned about a family history. And so we have the opportunity to engage them in people making good informed choices and being kind of very clear about whether or not their pedigree really does warrant that they be in a high risk group or not. Yes. Right. So uh, the question is about there's a difference between disease specific mortality and all cause mortality. And it's a somewhat controversial issue, right? Some people would say, well, why? Um, maybe I would get breast cancer screening because I don't want to die of breast cancer, but I know I'm going to die of something, right? And so I think it's important to look at all-cause mortality to make sure that our screening and treatment algorithm is actually not causing 
death prematurely due to uh, radiation or chemotherapy or other things. That's why when I looked at that ovarian cancer data, I was quite concerned about a slightly higher death rate amongst the screen group, which could be due to some of the things that I mentioned. It's hard to know. It wasn't statistically significant, so I can't make too much of it. But it does remind me that we do have to keep up with all-cause mortality. And here's where the controversy is. In my view, it's not because we think that that should uh, be improved. It's just to make sure it's not worse. But I know that, again, it's, it's somewhat controversial, but... Yeah. But if it's not improved, <coughs> one could say you're going through a lot of testing, a lot of treatment, a lot of worry, and you're not living any longer at the end of your life. So why do it? Right. So that's the countervailing argument is if you're not living longer overall, then, then what is this screening and disease-specific mortality reduction doing for you in general? And I think it's a fair question. As I said, it's kind of controversial about how people look at that, but I think it's always reasonable to, to pose that question because we, we certainly want people to live longer, healthier lives. And going through the screening cascade, although you may extend life, and the quality of that life might not be so great, uh, that becomes a bit of a, a controversial issue if you're, if you're living with a, 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 a disease that is disabling. So it, it's a little complicated and controversial, but I appreciate your bringing it up. Yes, sir. It does. So thank you for bringing that up. So the question is, within a, a particular organ, can we have non-aggressive and aggressive cancers? That's what I was trying to get at with the good, the bad, and the ugly, the proportional attribution of good, bad, and ugly for that particular organ uh, may, may vary. We know that a lot of prostate cancer and thyroid cancer can be very indolent and well-behaved in kind of good cancers. That doesn't mean there's not a sliver of those that are bad that are screenable. It's just very, they must be fairly small because we've done lots of several randomized trials trying to see whether or not we can impact on that. But it's hard to disentangle that from all the people that we pull along who have the indolent cancers. So I, I agree with you that I think within even a target organ, there's a lot of heterogeneity, and that's what's causing a lot of uh, confusion. And I'm hoping that in the future we're going to be able to disentangle that a little bit at, the, at, at, at some stage to be able to minimize the harms and maximize the benefits. But I think you're absolutely right. Yes, sir. Uh, you were mentioning something about biomarkers. How foolproof is genetic testing? Well, <laughs> let me tell you, genetic, nothing is foolproof in medicine. I will just tell you. I think probably one of the most foolproof things, and I'll just make this statement, and I'm an obstetrician, I can say this, is when we do karyotyping of a fetus, for example, we're pretty sure we know what the chromosomes are. That's one example of where we have pretty good information. But even then, we still have some disclarity due to uh, chimerism and other things. So it's, it's a little complicated. So I don't know. I think the jury's still out. I think we have a lot to learn about biomarkers. We have a lot to learn about genetics, a lot to learn about susceptibility. I'm really somewhat concerned that in, in many things that the technology runs so far ahead of our thoughtful clinical application. And we just don't know a lot. And we just always have to be very careful. And um, there's this balance that we have to live of not being a Luddite, Right? I mean, we want to not say no to everything, but by the same token, we want to be careful. And so that's the balance. That's, I would say, the, the balance of an academician, right? It's trying to understand the point at which you should adopt something new and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the certainty around what you need to know for certain to do that. And that's why the task force has that very, very laborious, uh, laborious process is to try to make sure that they... They're not perfect, but that they minimize these errors, and they don't want to do something too early, but also not too late. Even with the lung cancer screening recommendation, it lagged the trial results by at least a year. And there was a lot of criticism of the task force saying, you're not recommending something that we think is, should be implemented now. People are losing their lives because you don't, you're being silent on this. So there's always going to be this lag time where people... Um, we're going to have to really think about that right balance. And sometimes they will never, they may, uh, it may go on for uh, many, many, many years. Yes, sir. Right. So the question really is, can we have more focused screening? Can we kind of define a group of people that are just really 
more likely to benefit and then just focus on them. Because as I told you from the cervical cancer point of view, we're, you know, we're, we're kind of doing what I call the bulldozer effect, you know, like screening every year as soon as possible, never end, that kind of a, an approach. It's very inattentive to harms. But I'm thinking that we're getting smarter about that. The first, the first way to constrain screening is constrain the age to begin screening and, and at least thinking about an age uh, to end screening. That's the first demographic variable is age. The second way to do it might be what I mentioned in cervical cancer screening of saying, well, since we know cervical cancer is caused by a viral infection, maybe we should only focus on people who have evidence of having had that infection. So that's another way of thinking about it. Uh, that has challenges because the virus that caused the infection, has, it's estimated that up to 80% of women are exposed to it over their lifetime. So it's not very helpful if you have a very high prevalent uh, risk factor. So we have a lot to learn about that. But I absolutely agree that we're trying, that the shift is going away from this population-based screening and more toward targeted screening. And that's going to have a lot of benefits. It'll be controversial because we're not going to find that 100% proposition. By constraining it, we might get 90%, and then people are going to be really concerned about that 10% we're not capturing, but these are going to be the challenges. Until our tests get much more specific, and they're not quite there yet, um, cancer is complex. The biology is complicated, like the gentleman said. Yes, ma'am. Yes, thank you for asking that. So the question is, what kind of evidence is gathered about morbidity of screening uh, and, and in addition to mortality? Well, there's a lot more attention to that, but it could be so much better. Uh, even in, I'll tell you, in the lung cancer screening trials, they tried pretty hard to keep up with all the harms. The problem with harms are, everyone knows what the benefits are, so we can capture those, but the harms can be things that happen outside of the scope of medicine, right? The disruptions in life by having to go to many appointments, the, uh, the concern and the worry, those t types of things. The out-of-pocket expenses for patients, right? So um, even with, I didn't talk about lung cancer screening too much, but I'll tell you over three rounds of screening with a low-dose CT scan, which is the recommendation, about 40% of patients have a positive test. Most of them are false positive, over 90%. So that tells you something about the harms even of that. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of improvements that we have to make, and I think we simply have to be better about collecting the harms and getting better about trying to integrate them or at least, at least uncovering them. And I think that's what the task force tried to do with breast cancer screening. They used harms because a lot of the trials didn't report harms. They only reported the benefit. We have a large prospective cohort study of women getting mammography screening that's based out of San Francisco. And so they used that data from that database to estimate the harms of false positives and unnecessary biopsies. So we're getting a little more attuned to that, and there's a new effort trying to do that with cervical cancer screening as well. Again, the signal that we are now near the ends of the time, so I am sorry that I'm going to um, thank Dr. Sawaya yes, very much. Yes, my pleasure. Thank you.